Good afternoon, I'm Alan Travis and I'm currently restoring a 1913 Bugatti Type 22. Uh, Bugatti started creating cars with his own name on it in 1911 and in 1911, 12 and 13 they made uh, half a dozen cars a year for the first two or three years until they finally, finally um, upped their game and made 70 or 80 cars in 1914. But very few cars were made before the First World War. Uh, only about 400 cars total were made from 1911 through 1919. This is the 321st one, which is considered a 1913 late automobile. All the Bugattis were sporting, racing type vehicles. This one is a Type 22. This one's got a long wheelbase. Um, got about a foot longer than the shortest ones that he made. Uh, the 1913 was the very first one that had the, the typical 16 leaf rear suspension, which is what this one has. So it's, it's quarter elliptical and the leaves come from the, from the rear. Uh, really compliant suspension. They kept the same suspension from 1913 on. The transmission is a four speed transmission. The, um, the transmission isn't just the transmission. The transmission is the footboards for the passenger and the driver. The transmission is also the trunnion support for the rear end. The transmission is also the mount for the pedals. The transmission also is the, the stif stiffening reinforcing agent for the frame. So Eto Bugatti made small cars. They were extremely quick and efficient cars and he did that by utilizing weight saving ideas by both materials and by design. Uh, Eto Bugatti was the Michelangelo of automobiles. All throughout his whole career creating automobiles and his motors and all they were the most sought after as they are today vehicles. Sometimes it took 50 or 60 years before people kind of latched on to them and started collecting them. Uh, Bugatti cars were always the always at the top of the pile. Uh, this Bugatti is the first year that has the ovalized or the horseshoe radiator, which is the same radiator as all of the other Bugattis from this point on have the same shape, which is um, very easily recognizable. Uh, the radiator is considered honeycomb, so there's 2400 pieces of tubing that are stacked to make the radiator and then they're all uh, swedged on the end to a honeycomb pattern so there is actually no tank in the radiator. The tank itself is the voids between all of the pieces of tubing that create the honeycomb. Really efficient, different uh, cooling system. There's only two Bugattis in the world um, that have four-wheel brakes the, the, uh, that, that I have found at least. The car that was sent for the Indianapolis 500 in 1914, it had four-wheel brakes and so does this one. Uh, the four-wheel brakes were cable operated as were all of uh, Bugatti's brakes, braking systems. So it makes it an amazing, efficient car to drive fast when you have four-wheel brakes. The transmission is a four-speed transmission. It's got very narrow cut gears. All the shafts inside of it are, are really, really small diameter, but they're exactly the right diameter it needs to be to be strong enough. Ito Bugatti was into materials, so he made an extensive use of the best materials of the day. The, the aluminum that he used is still perfect today, where you can polish all of the, the aluminum components. The rear end is a, is a beautiful work of art itself. Um, this car was made in Germany because the, the portion of France today that is considered the Bugatti factory was in Germany at the time and virtually all the parts are autographed with who actually put them together. And then you see an E and a B. So that's who put this together a hundred and some years ago was Ietra Bugatti himself. And then this number here, the 14 X45, that's the gear ratio of it, and it's rear end uh, number 819. The, 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 the steel trunnion that goes to, for, to the rear axle to the transmission is very lightweight because it has a piece of ash inserted inside of it and that's what he did. So it's got a new piece of ash inserted into it now. 
have the the chassis is is finished. It's ready for the body to be placed on. Uh, since we last time talked, we've now got the fenders on and the running boards and the running board um, runners to step on. The gas tank is now mounted. <clears throat> the, the 22s, the model 22s and 23s, are the first uh, versions of the Bugatti had a little bit longer wheelbase, so their gas tank is underneath the, the body, where the Type 13 was an oval above the body. So because it's below the body, it won't flow the fuel to the motor. So it has two fittings. One is for air, and one is for gasoline. So the driver, or mechanician, pushes on an air pump and pumps the, the um, gas tank with, with air to pressurize the gas tank to about two pounds of pressure, and then it flows uphill to the, to the carburetor. In the back of the car now, we have our original uh, Arizona plate and the Bugatti name badge. So the tank is is been chemically dipped. It's been um, the holes have been resoldered. It doesn't leak now, and it's been sealed on the inside so no uh, small fragments will break off. And it uh, we pressure tested it to six pounds of pressure. So as long as the cap is tight, it'll hold its pressure and then the air pump that the, that the driver pushes will pressurize the tank. The plate is an original type Arizona plate since Arizona was not a state that issued tags in 1913. Um, the person that had the car would have gone to a hardware type store or a trading post and bought the, the numbers and made the leather and made his own plate and that's what his plate, that's how he would be registered for licensing. It wasn't until 1914 until Arizona had actual metal plates. The fenders are now all painted, and on the fenders are aluminum, uh, original fenders. Um, they're, they're in really, really nice shape. They have the equivalent of 24 coats of paint on them, and it's solid pigment. There's no clear. This is the bodywork that goes on the car. The body is all steel, hand-formed, hand-beat. Uh, the bodywork was, was brilliant. We had it chemically dipped to take the original paint off. Um, in doing so, we found no rust, no corrosion, uh, with just a minimal amount of, of metal filler. Uh, the, the body turned out to be almost a perfect, perfectly square and straight and smooth body. It has also the equivalent of, of 24 paints, 24 coats of solid pigment. Uh, and each, each coat was sanded with 400 and 1,000 grit between. Uh, and these nice, beautiful darts on the inside of the body are beautiful, and as, as well as these. And you can see all those. They, they did a really nice job back then. The spare tire is mounted on the body. The framework, there's a framework inside the body, which could be original or could be put in in the 50s. I don't know when, when they put the framework in. But it's a it's very, very strong body and you, two people can carry it very, very easily and set it on the car. So in the next two or three days, it'll be on the car and it'll, it'll be on there to stay. Good afternoon. What we have here today is a motor and a, and a car, 1913 Bugatti. This is a signature motor. Uh, the motor has this signature on it. The transmission has this signature on it. The rear end has this signature on it and the, even the rear suspension has a signature on it. Uh, pretty bold for the day. This is a four-cylinder, 1400cc motor, high RPM, all roller cam. It's mated to a four-speed transmission, and the four-speed transmission will allow it to go more than 55 mile an hour, even in third gear, and fourth gear, probably in the 75 to 80 mile an hour range. What you're seeing on the, on the motor, this is a completely aluminum block in two sections. The pan holds the bearings as well as the top portion does. These are the breathers. Uh, the carburetor uh, is hung off of a beautiful intake manifold that Eotra Bugatti made. It's a nice beautiful bronze manifold and it's uh, polished on the inside. The, carburetor draws half of the air through the center of the block 
which is heated air. And this is the backside of the flange that takes the hot air from the exhaust system and funnels it to the intake to the carburetor on the other side. So it, it better itemizes the fuel. This oil line here is for the oil that goes into the overhead cam and overhead um, lifter box and it returns back to the sump. A very, very beautiful and ornate oil pump. Uh, the oil pump draws engine oil from the bottom of the pan up to this oil pump and then circulates it into the pan where the pretty much the dry sumped portion of the oiling is. Also it feeds the, uh, the overhead cam and the lifters. What these are right here, these are how you adjust the valves. You simply unthread these little caps, these little bronze caps, and then you put, you measure the valve clearances, and then you put shims underneath the valve caps. This is the exhaust system. And the exhaust system is a cast nickel header system. Uh, it is so, so beautiful. If you look inside of this, the, each of these legs are even have fins inside of this so it, it makes the air completely go to each of the chambers. This is the water pump. The water pump is an absolutely beautiful bronze and copper water pump. It's all rebuilt now with a new stainless steel shaft. This is the um, cam drive for the overhead cam. There's a, there's a shaft here that spins from the crankshaft. And then this is the, the crank start. This is the bottom oil spigot and this is the top oil spigot. So if you have the, the, the pan full of oil and you open the top one and oil pours out, that means you have too much oil. If you open up that one and you don't have any oil come out, you're far less than the minimum amount you need to add some oil. Ayrton Bugatti did everything for efficiency. So the, the arms from the motor that are cast into the upper portion of the block, these fit right into the frame rails and stiffen up the car. So instead of having steel frame rails, the engine itself is, this, is the stiffener. This is the famous Bugatti overhead valve head for the eight valve motors. Uh, this head has got his name embossed in it. He has signature, which is amazing for 1913 to do that. Um, he did that on just a few cars. There's very, very, very few cars in the world that have an Eotra Bugatti cast head with his name cast, his signature cast in it. This is one car that has it. Uh, the way this operates is, I'm going to turn the head upside down. Well, this is how you adjust the valves by taking these caps out. And you adjust the valves by putting shims underneath the valve lash caps. But the, the interesting part about these, these are banana tappets on the inside of this. So as, as, you, as, the, as the crankshaft spins down below, there's a shaft that drives this overhead shaft and then makes these lifters come um, in and out and that pushes on the valves to open and close them. The interesting thing about this is uh, Yutra Bugatti wanted the valve train to wave virtually nothing so we could have a lot of RPM. So he was able to spin his motors twice the RPM of the, of the engines of the day. And these tappets that are moving back and forth are in the shape of a, of a banana. So these are curved. The camshaft, which is all in ball bearings, is in the center of this. And the camshaft drives both the, the tack drive on this end, and this end is driven from the motor and spins the oil pump for the motor. Okay? So as this cam spins inside of this, inside of its bearings, when the cam lobes hit these banana tappets, these are curved, and they're about a half an inch to three quarter inch long, and they're curved to the camshaft. So the camshaft hook pushes directly onto these, and these push directly down right on the valves, so there's no rocking motion at all. It's completely pushing straight on the valves. The interesting thing about the process was, it was virtually impossible from an engineering standpoint to create a lifter that would come and do this. So what these are, and this was his own invention, these are bronze valve rocker 
um, tappet holders, and this, they are filled with white metal, which is Babbitt material. And Ito Bugatti had figured out that if he coated these hardened lifters, banana lifters, with a set, with a settling soot, he could pour these with these in place, and the acetylene soot would be used as a release agent, so they would spin and have about four thousandths of an inch, point four thousandths of an inch of, of play. And that's what they actually did. We had three, three of these lifters are still the original Babbitt that Eotor Bugatti himself poured. This one is what we poured with some gentlemen in Tucson that that experimented with different uh, types of Babbitt material and different amounts of soot and heat and they finally got one after 80 hours they were able to fill this one right here and now it operates as perfectly as the others and it, the gap that this has and the, the play is nothing I mean just just nothing so it's uh, half a thousandth of an inch yet the amount of friction it, it offers is nothing so they're going to work perfectly now we'll take out one of those banana lifters and we'll describe it even more. Okay. We have now one of the, the banana lifters, the banana tappets, out and it's out of its housing. This is bronze and then this is the Babbitt material poured inside of this. And you see how these are curved. There's no way to possibly machine that. So the only way you can do it is you pour it with, again, the acetylene soot on there, and, and the acetylene soot acts as a release agent, so it operates nicely like it does. I'll turn this, and you can see how the cam spins on the inside, and you can see how these open and close. So an incredibly neat design by having incredibly lightweight materials doing the spinning. And the camshaft, this camshaft, we put new bearings in it, so it's got three sets of bearings inside this. You have to take off these lobes to put these bearings on, so we did that. And those are pinned and soldered, is how they got those done. That was a, kind of a scary thing to do. And we put precision bearings in it too, um, so it should run just, just effortlessly. And this cavity is filled with oil when it's running, and then the extra goes down into the into the the head and then drains to the cylinder block. This is the Bugatti head with the valves, seven of the valves already installed and this is a this is the eighth which is not installed. So Bugatti was incredibly um, instrumental in high-end technologies as far as creating the best possible circumstance for machining and high output performance of motors. So this is his valve that he made and this has the number of the car, which is not car 317, and it's cylinder number 3. And the seat comes out. So when you do your machining for your, your final valve fitting and your lapping and whatever you're going to do, you do it outside the motor in the smallest, most accurate lathe you could possibly have. Then when it's all machined, you simply place it into the motor, into the head like that, and then this threads, keeping it in position. But in the meantime, if you ever crack a valve seat or otherwise make a valve seat not work, you have it out. You don't have to worry about the, the head so that it can't crack. And this is nickel steel, incredibly hard material. The, the valves presented a, a problem for us because the valves are a really large diameter and a real small stem. So it's almost an inch and three quarter diameter and a five sixteenths or eight millimeter stem. And there's no backing of the valve whatsoever. A normal valve has got a lot of material in there. This has none because he wanted the valves as light as they could possibly be. And he wanted the seat to include as much um, valve guide as possible. So when this is in place, there's only an eighth of an inch that doesn't have a, doesn't have a, a guide on it. And this weight of a, valve, of a valve for a hundred some years ago was incredible. It was not done. But today, this narrow metal, even though it's nickel steel, is just too narrow. It'll burn with the modern gas lanes. So we needed to do something about that. So I like to drive all my vehicles, and I want this to be a driver also. 
So we had to go to manly valves where we went in this case, and they did the specs on all their different types of stainlesses and, and the other steel they had, and then they, and they wouldn't support um, this geometry of a valve because there's just no backing. And they have two grades of titanium, and the second grade would work. So they made me some valves out of titanium so we can drive it on normal gasoline. This is the modern titanium valve that they made for us, made in the same configuration as the Atropogades valve. Um, virtually all the same specs. This is eight millimeters, and we had a little bit of wear. We had about three thousandths of an inch in the valve guide. We bored the valve guide to five sixteenths, and then we made these valves with five sixteenths. So these fit in here perfectly snug, um, and, uh, and will operate perfectly. So the, this is ready for final assembly now. The cylinder head mounts flush with the top of the block, but Bugatti, to make the strength that much more, made the bottom of the cylinders extend into the block which cools the cylinders that much more because they're inside of the aluminum and, and makes it more strong. So that you can put it together almost like a puzzle. So pretty neat. I'm going to install one of the pistons to show you how it works. There's an oil pump that creates oil pressure and then pressurizes this copper line. And this copper line is like a sprinkler system. It fills up that channel, that channel, that channel, and that channel with oil. And that's where the oil goes from the oil pump. It doesn't go to the drilled crankshaft. The crankshaft is solid. This is a three main bearing motor. Uh, and these troughs are full of oil. And the things that pick up the oil from those troughs are these giant dippers on the ends of the rods. Big, big, big dippers. Ietro Bugatti himself poured, or he, one of his five guys, poured this Babbitt in 1913. And this Babbitt is a bronze-lead mixture. It's 10% lead, 90% bronze. And they held up so well, he told people they would last as many as one million miles. Well, I don't know how many miles are on this motor, but it's now ready to go back together again. And with just a tiny bit of cutting on the valve cap itself, uh, about a thousandth of an inch, we're able to reuse this, the same Babbitt material that Ierto Pagotti poured more than 104 years ago. This came with aluminum pistons that Ieto Bugatti installed on the motor in 1913. Uh, it had four rings per piston and we have got uh, new pistons made, aluminum also the same, but now they're forged. And these pistons have three rings per piston and Total Seal made us the rings and Total Seal allows us to probably crank start this with one turn because the total seal doesn't have to heat up and expand the rings before it has maximum compression. So I'm just going to put this on by hand tight and you'll see how this operates. This pan, the way it's designed, is designed as a dry sump system. Our, our rod is on now. This is the direction it goes. And then at the bottom of the rod scoops up the oil from the bottom of the pan. So that sloshes oil um, in the rest of the, the crank. So there's, there's a capture area, which we'll show in a, another section. There's a capture area for this main and for this main and for this main that's, that's built into the crankcase itself. The oil level, when this is full of oil, there is no oil in this cavity here up to, the, up to the, uh, tr the troughs. So the oil sits about an inch and a half lower than the troughs. So the crankshaft never spins through a giant amount of oil. It only spins through 
a half inch of oil in these troughs, and these are pressurized with about 15 pounds of pressure, so these, these probably are always full. And as this spins, it picks up that oil, pressurizes the rods, and then sloshes it to the sectioned, uh, the sectioned scoops inside the crankcase, the top part of the crankcase, to um, oil the mains. And this was good enough um, for, for at least another 10 years for Bugatti, and he would spin the engines as much as 5,000 RPM with this method. So what you're looking at is everything is stock, except for you see new pistons, and we put a slight dome, about a five millimeter dome on it, with total seal rings, and the crank is stock, the rods, the pour of the Babbitt, that's all stock material. That dipper is a really beautiful, large, large scoop that's on there. I'm gonna really pick up some oil as that sloshes through the, the pan. Even 104 years ago, for a racing engine, they were even drilled on the I-beam rods. That's pretty amazing. We didn't do that. That was done uh, as we took the engine apart, and we were probably the first ones to take the engine apart. So um, they already did things for, for minimal weight. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Well, we've worked for four or five days putting those parts together that we had out earlier. The engine is now completely together. Uh, when you turn the crank on this end, the, even the tap drive spins on the other end. This is the tack drive. So this is going straight into the firewall, straight into the dash. So when I turn the engine over, you see the tack drive spin, and that's right on the center of the cam. The cam is inside of this. So it's absolutely a direct drive for the cam uh, and for the tack input. That's just a beautiful design. Um, there's no antique car that has that. I mean, that's just a really, really nice design. The, the engine has 105 pounds of compression, which is great for an antique uh, race engine. Uh, that turns out to be about 6.6 .6 to 1 compression ratio, which should be perfect. Uh, we upped it about 0.9 you know, just right at a pound of compression, which should give us about 15% more torque, which is good for it. Since the gasoline is, is much more octane than the 40 they had back then, uh, I'm sure it'll withstand it very, very well and very nicely. The thing that took so long and the longest on putting it together was the valve train. The valve train is up here. We discussed that before, showing you the banana tappets, and this is how you get to the banana tappets. Well, the valve train on most cars have push rods, rockers, valve caps, valves, a bunch of things. Uh, for the Bugatti, the valve train simply has an incredibly light valve and a little cap. The entire adjustment for the valve train is making this cap with a different amount of clearance. So these are a whole bunch of caps that I made, and these are just sort of like test caps made these on the mill. So what you do when you put a Bugatti motor together, you make, make eight caps for an eight valve car, 16 caps for a 16 valve car, and you make them all to 120 thousandths of an inch. And then put them all on, tighten everything up in the final position, and then measure with the amount of feeler gauges you need and see roughly how much thickness you need to add to it. So if you see these caps here, these are my, my spare, my test caps, that one is 120 thousandths, that's 110 thousandths, that's 158 thousandths. So by knowing which cap you have on, uh, you know how much clearance you need to add. And, and the, the way you tell what the clearance is, the, you're, measuring, you're measuring the thickness between the top of the cap and how far down the thickness goes. So you can measure it overall by just simply putting it on on a valve and see what your rating is um, and when you get all done when you get the, everything finally assembled and when you get everything tightened and torqued correctly 
Um, a good number is about eight thousandths of an inch of valve lash. Um, you know that after you've run in for a while, it's going to be a little bit less or a little bit more based on how things shift around. So you're still going to change it some. So I went ahead and made um, three caps for each valve. Um, I made them with three thousandths and five thousandths tighter and three thousandths and five thousandths looser. So when it comes time to readjust my valves, I'll simply grab in my valve cap box and put the right ones on. These are made out of tool steel and I did these on the mill and I hardened them. Uh, they're about 65 Rockwell, so they're hardened and they're polished, the ones that are in there at least. The, this is the finished oil pump. The way you start the engine it, is you simply take this cap off this oil line, fill this oil line with oil, which uh, fills all the troughs in the bottom of the motor. Then you take the cap off the top of the oil pump and then you pour oil in there to prime the pump. And then on the back side of here, there's another spigot that comes, there's a line that comes from the dash and you, you hit the plunger four or five times on the dash and that lubricates your valve train. And puts oil, uh, maybe a little bit of spray in the valve guides or at least put some oil on the cam so when it starts to run, that vapor gets in the valve guides to put a little bit of lubrication in there before you've even cranked it at all. This is the finished header system. Um, the header system uh, has two purposes. One, it takes all the heat away from the engine. There is no exhaust manifold at all. The exhaust valve is literally an inch and a half from this, from the exhaust manifold, uh, which is a header system. So the entire amount of heat that's carried in the, in the cylinder is only a couple inches worth of the cylinder that is even exposed to heat. And these are equal length um, chambers, or close to that at least, and they're even, even at the bottom, they're sectioned to, to keep them running all the way out to the end in different, in different paths for the air, which is really neat. But you see this horn here, and this horn goes all the way through the engine block, and that takes the heat from the headers, the cast nickel headers, and the carburetor sucks through this horn, which is the heated air. So you have a much more atomized mixture because you're sucking from, from warm air. The water pump is on a cross shaft from the tower um, cam gear. So as the engine is spinning over, this simply rotates and, and spins the water pump up. So it's, it's virtually, it's absolutely direct drive. So there's, there's no play whatsoever and there's, there's no loss of motion, uh, no belt of, of course and no, no extra cams or anything. It's simply a, a shaft from the, from the tower that goes to the valve train. Um, the water is injected into this half of the crankcase and that half. The, engine holds exactly a half a gallon of water. The radiator holds two and a half gallons. This pump has got a cast impeller and then impeller uh, basically fills the entire void of the pump. So when this thing is spinning, even though it's so small, it really uh, pushes out a lot of water. I don't know how many gallons per minute, but I would, I would imagine something in the 20 gallon per minute at 1500 RPM. So that's a really a nice, a nice rate. This bolt here is how you adjust the movement of the impeller on the inside. This is just bronze, 1913 bronze, which is harder than brass is today. So this barely touches the center shaft of the impeller, keeping the impeller exactly where it needs to be in the center of the pump. On this side of the pump is the wadding. Uh, as the pump wadding wears, you can simply dial this in and crank a little bit more wadding crank a little bit more um, tightness on the wadding. And the wadding is basically asbestos or graphite covered cotton. And then this is an oiler that lubricates the, the bearings that are inside of the oil, the water pump. And the water pump has a new stainless steel shaft that I made because the original nickel shaft had a lot of pitting. Uh, you see two, two different spigots on the, on the water pump. The bottom spigot is the one that you actually drain the water out of the 
out of the entire system. This is the lowest point that water is on the car, um, at least on the motor. So in the winter, you would simply open up this spigot. And then, so why would you drain the, the top one? Well, you wouldn't, you would just purge it. Make sure that it could airlock. So by opening up this spigot, you can drain the, the top of the pump of the air. So you would open that just enough where you saw water start coming out, then you would close it again so you didn't, it didn't airlock for you. And it, it's made out of bronze, beautiful, beautiful handmade water pump that Ideo Bugatti made. It's just gorgeous. To start the engine up, this carburetor, you turn the gas on, and then you simply push this lever down, and that's the float, and that floods the carburetor. So as soon as you see any gasoline out of this hole whatsoever here, uh, which is sort of a, a choke hole, or that, it's, it's sucking air from here, and it's also sucking air on the back side through the center of the crankcase on the exhaust side. So it's sucking cool air from here and sucking hot air from here. And also, if, if you flooded the carburetor, it'll, it'll just drip out of here where it won't drip up and out of the other side. So when you flood the carburetor by, pulling, by pushing that down, as soon as you see any, any indication of any gasoline at all, you've got enough to crank start the car. Uh, right now, there is no gasoline in, in the car or in the motor, but I believe if I just put literally a couple drops of, of gasoline in the intake manifold and I cranked it, the mag will fire at, at really slow cranking speed. It would fire on this bench, but I think I'll break my legs on my stand, so I'm not going to do that. We'll do that in a few hours on, on our video. These are breathers. Uh, this is how you fill the oil in, in the engine, and the engine is basically two halves. So you, you would fill this size, side of the engine and you'd fill this side of the engine. And then on, again, when we go back to the other side, you'll see the, the taps. And then we'll describe the taps in a minute. The intake manifold is a, a beautiful, beautiful bronze casting that we covered before. Uh, that shows what it looks like with it all connected and all together. The, this tap here is if you live in cold weather. It's another way to guarantee that you have drain the water out of your crankcase so in the winter time it doesn't do any expansion and, and crack the cylinder. So you have this one you can open and you have the one on the water pump you can open to make sure you drain the oil out. We have total seal rings on the engine uh, and we have three rings and they're high quality pistons also. So it really shouldn't burn any oil, shouldn't leak any oil. Um, so a lot of the early engines You've got to put a cord in every 100 miles. I don't expect to put a cord in much more than every 1,000 miles. You know, after all, it's a Bugatti. Uh, 